Good evening. My name is Jin Wang, Dean of the Bridge School of Business Administration. On behalf of the Bridge School faculty, staff, and students, I would like to welcome you to tonight's health insurance debate. Our event this evening is one of many that we have planned as a part of Bridge Business Week, an entire week devoted to helping our students network with members of the business community, engage in career preparation activities, and prepare to become ethical leaders in the global business community. Tonight's health insurance debate is made possible by a generous grant from the Charles Koch Foundation. I want to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, Dr. Stephen Mullins, for his leadership in organizing this event. I also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Dan Ponder for agreeing to serve as tonight's uh, moderate for tonight's debate. Dr. Ponder is the LE Matter Professor of Political Science and Director of the Matter Center for Polit Politics and Citizenship. He teaches courses on American politics, the American presidency, Congress, and constitutional law. If you think you have seen him somewhere before, you are correct. <laughs> He's a frequent commentator on American and Missouri politics for both local and national media outlets, including NPR Morning Edition, CBS Radio, The Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, and USA Today. Dr. Ponder is widely published and is currently working on a large scale project on presidential leverage as well as one on the po political economy of the Obama administration. Originally from St. Louis, Dr. Pounder grew up in Springfield and was a 1984 graduate of Springfield Catholic High School. At the end of today's program, you are invited to meet with Dr. Weisbart and Dr. Goodman in the hallway area. Dr. Goodman's books are available for purchase and he will be there for book signing. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Dan Pounder. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm really pleased that uh, Dr. Mullins and Dr. Ted Bagalus, who uh, sort of spearheaded this, asked me to moderate. Uh, that actually kind of overblows what my actual um, job here tonight is. It's to basically introduce uh, our participants, sit in the middle, listen to uh, them for each about 15 minutes, after which each will have about five minutes of rebuttal, and then I'm going to point to people who have questions. That's, that's pretty much my job tonight. Um, I am the director of the Metter Center, uh, and Ellie Metter, for those of you who grew up here will recognize the name. Um, as was noted in the introduction, I grew up here, and so I played on the uh, baseball fields and swam in the swimming pool over at Metter uh, Park. And I'll be honest, I didn't know until I came back here uh, 12 years ago that Dr. Metter had, or Professor Metter had been a, a professor of political science and economics here at Drury. In 1968, there was an endowment established in his name, and when that happened, he said, and this is a quote, I had in mind my chief objective to impress upon my students the importance of solving the many perplexing problems and questions that they will meet in the society in which they live. They should take a constructive and active part in trying to bring about a more democratic and more hopeful world in which future generations can live. And so it is events like this that I think, um, though I never met him, uh, that Dr. Metter would be most pleased to, that this endowment was going to support. All right, now to the main event. Uh, I'm going to introduce each person who will speak, and then after that I'll, I'll introduce the next person. So the first person 
uh, speaking in favor of a single-payer system is Dr. Ed Weisbart, MD, who chairs the Missouri Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program, which has more than 21,000 members nationwide. Dr. Weisbart is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Washington University in St. Louis, and he received his MD from the University of Illinois. He's published several articles over the years regarding the health care needs of the uninsured and volunteers in a variety of safety net clinics and other nonprofits in the St. Louis area. He also recruits other physicians to practice at free clinics across the nation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Ed Weisbart. Hello. Okay. Been looking forward to this for a while, so I'm delighted to see you all here. Um, I know I'm here to speak about Medicare for All, but I've got to do full disclosure, which I probably should have told my hosts before this, but I don't really care about Medicare for All. I don't really care about single payer. That's, I mean, we'll talk about it, but that's not what wakes me up in the morning. That's not what lights a fire in my shoes, and yet here I am. But I'll explain what that means in a minute. What really excites me, what I'm really passionate about, are two other things. Number one, democracy, which I think is actually on the brink these days. And so I applaud Drury for having pretty much opposite point of views with a surprising amount of common ground where we agree. But I applaud you for having us um, here to have this conversation for all y'all coming here. So number one, democracy. And number two that I care about that really I focus on is all these patients who I see. I, I, I still see patients on a regular basis and I'm constantly running into someone who has something dire going on in their lives that, I, that they know is bothering them and I know what to do about it and we can't we can't get the funding to get this taken care of and disastrous things occur and I'll spare you the examples of that. But So I happen to believe that this strategy, Medicare for All, is the most prudent solution to that. Um, my background, as you started to hear, is I'm a physician. I practiced in Chicago at Rush Medical Center for 20 years. I moved to St. Louis in 2003 to be Chief Medical Officer at Express Scripts, which taught me a lot about the business community and made me realize the importance of having a business plan for changes. And then I organized the Missouri chapter of this group, nonprofit group, um, as, you, as you heard. We're open to all people for membership. You don't need to be a physician despite our name. So uh, I believe sourcing is really important. So here's a sample of, of the kinds of sources that I'm using. So every uh, slide that I show you that has numbers will have a footnote at the bottom so I can tell you the exact source if you need to know. But I believe, I believe in the value of having you know, good objective information. So why build a system on Medicare? Well, uh, Medicare is Pretty cool. It's got a long track record of success. It rescues seniors from poverty, and I'll prove to you, I think, that it extends um, life expectancy. Um, so Harry Truman was the first member of it 52 years ago. There's three things about Medicare that are not as widely recognized as I think they should be, and we'll dr drill in on those. First is it expands freedom of choice. We'll explain that in a moment. Secondly, it eliminates an awful lot of waste, and we'll explain that. And then lastly, I think I'll show you evidence that it, it, it extends lives. So let's talk about that for a minute. Freedom of choice. And I need to introduce you to my mother-in-law. There she is, all 10 feet of her. Hi, Ma. So she lives in Florida. She has Medicare and a supplement. And I have her permission to tell you she has a rare genetic disease in her heart. Rare. And this disease is fatal. It turns out it, uh, it's treatable. It doesn't show up until your mid-70s. She's in her mid-80s now. Um, and uh, there's only three places in the country that actually focus on treating this. One of them is in St. Louis. So we flew her from Florida to St. Louis, got her this expert world-class care. Uh, this was about six years ago, and she went back to Florida, and she's doing fine now. Um, she didn't have to pay a penny for that because it turns out that she has Medicare and a supplement, and so that covered, she's prepaid for that basically, so it didn't cost her a thing. I, on the other hand, have um, an insurance product that I buy through the Affordable Care Act for my wife and myself. I spend $2,000 a month on premium with a $6,000 deductible. If my wife, my mother-in-law's daughter, turns out to have the same condition, and if we wanted to go from St. Louis to, let's say, Pittsburgh to treat that, that wouldn't be in my network. That would be out of pocket. The $100,000 or so that we spent on my mother-in-law as a community, um, I would have to pay that full retail, and most folks can't afford to do that. So my mother-in-law with Medicare and a supplement, not the Medicare Advantage plan, Medicare and a supplement, can go anywhere that she wants, and, and my wife and I cannot, and y'all probably cannot. So if you want to talk about messing with um, her Medicare, she gets a different face. 
So, so I said you could go anywhere that she wants. Well, how, is that really true? We all know that there are doctors who won't take Medicare. So how many? Turns out that there's nearly 700,000 physicians in practice. This data is from 2013 at that year in practice. And of those 10,000, or 700,000, there were 10,000 who didn't take Medicare. So it's true that there are thousands of doctors who won't take Medicare. However, there are hundreds of thousands who will, more than 98% of practicing physicians. And as a result, people with Medicare, particularly with a supplement these days, can go anywhere they're in control of their own healthcare decisions. It also means we stop wasting our money on bureaucracy. So here's the SEC filings of, uh, of actually uh, Medicare uh, medical loss ratio from 100%, if you're wonky enough to want to know that, I would call it overhead. And that's SEC filings from the first quarter of 2016. And then, you know, 15 to 20%, as you'd expect, traditional Medicare, according to the Medicare Trust Fund, including the brick and mortar, including the IRS staff that collects the taxes and all that, is about 2.5% for traditional Medicare. It goes up higher if you look at Part D or Part C, but traditional Medicare. So it's hard to make up that uh, remarkable overhead. And then lastly, and this is my wonkiest slide, and I apologize, but you all are up for that. So it's, it affects our life expectancy. This is a chart of a mortality rate in the United States as compared to 17 other peer nations stratified by age. So there's a seven-year-old American compared to seven-year-olds in 17 other peer nations. There's a 45-year-old, there's an 80-year-old. So life, actually mortality rate, but I think of it as life expect, remaining life expectancy, stratified by age as compared to 17 other peer nations. And no surprise, there is the United States merrily cruising along in the worst position, despite paying roughly double what any other country spends on healthcare in total per person per year. Um, so there's us, but well, you knew that, but you probably didn't know this. According to the Institute of Medicine, a pretty reliable source, um, once we turn 65, our mortality rate by age, or I think of it as life expectancy, plummets. We sky our, our life expectancy skyrockets. In other words, the most senior among us have the best health care predictions of anybody else in the world or rapidly get there. And that to me means that we have to have the world's best doctors and hospitals and nurses and all that. We have to, or you couldn't possibly make that happen. Um, we should be enormously proud of Medicare. That's why I think we should build a system on Medicare, because it's a darn good one in many ways. So I think of it as a market solution, and this is a ridiculously high-level summary, but on this end, you can say that there's three ways to organize healthcare in the world. One is this way, and of course, every country is different, but let's look at this way of organizing it. This is um, National Health Service, okay? This is socialized medicine. This is not what I'm here to talk about with you. It's not the position I advocate, but it does exist. It actually works pretty well in some settings. This is where you have publicly funded and publicly delivered, right? The government owns the means of production. The government owns the hospitals and employs the physicians and everybody. That is the definition of socialism. That is how the VA does it and a variety of other countries. And it is not what I'm here to talk about with you. At the other extreme is how we do it today. And you all are familiar with the problems and the gaps and all of that. I'm not going to belabor that. These are both, to my mind, extreme ways to set up health care. And I don't say that pejoratively. You know, but this is as far into medicine as a government can go. Therefore, I consider this an extreme model. Again, not what I'm here to talk about. And that's extreme in the sense that we're the only country that actually uses this kind of an organizational system. And maybe we've figured out the best solution, but when you're the only, and so maybe it's good, but when you're the only place doing something a certain way, that's by definition extreme. And I frame it like that because in the middle, there's what I think of as a pretty conservative model. It's pretty conservative. All this talking about is fixing the finance issues. So it's publicly funded, but it's privately delivered. It is Medicare. That's how Medicare works. That's how Medicare in Canada works. They call it Medicare. So it's publicly funded, but privately delivered. This doesn't fundamentally change the delivery model, although there are things we need to do there too. I think of this as a market solution because today I'm competing against other physicians for the most lucrative insurance contract that I can get my hands on. If I can get an insurance contract that's gonna pay me $5 more per person for the 4,000 people I'm gonna see this year, that's $20,000 more a year for maybe two or three hours of time spent negotiating forever. So, so I spend my time and doctors all over the country and medical groups spend their time negotiating for the most lucrative insurance contract and that's how we've applied the free market to healthcare. That's what it's doing to medical groups. 
Instead, you should be able to pick the doctor you want to go see, and you should go there, and you should stop going there when you don't want to go there. That, to me, is what a free market should be doing to, on the healthcare side. That's a better use for it, in my mind. That's applying the free market to the delivery side, although getting rid of these um, financial barriers we have. There turns out that there are a bill, there's a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate that would do just that. And uh, they're similar with some important differences. Uh, we'll talk about the one in the House, H.R. 676. And you should read it, H.R. 676. It's 30 pages. So it says a number of things. I'll call out two of the, more, of the bigger ones. Improve Medicare and expand it. And improve Medicare, what does that mean? It means fix the gaps in benefits, right? Medicare doesn't cover things that everybody knows it should cover. Eyeglasses, hearing aids, dentistry, for crying out loud. So put those improvements into Medicare so that you don't have to buy it separately. Give that to everybody and get rid of the financial barriers, right? Medicare today has massive copays and deductibles and seniors who can afford to buy a supplement or, a, or an advantage program or some other solution to fix that. Two thirds of seniors do that. So get rid of the financial barriers that really block healthcare that's what we mean when we say improve Medicare. And then give it to everybody. Give it to Congress. Give it to teachers. Give it to students. Give it to coal miners. Give it to, to everybody in the country. Not because it's a nice thing to do, which you, know, you could argue it is, but instead because that's the only way you get rid of the overhead, of the enormous, those 18% uh, overheads that I was showing you as compared to 2%. You only get, get to the savings if you do this. It also is the way that you can leverage the group purchasing power and let Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs. We'll talk about that more. That's the most powerful way to do that. And lastly, if you think about it, businesses today that are, have 100 employees or 200 employees, have their, they get one hemophiliac patient, they get one cancer patient, one hepatitis C patient, and their costs can skyrocket the next year to make up for that. So the variation is huge with a small risk pool. The best way to have predictable costs and have less risk is frankly to have the biggest risk pool you can, and that's what insurance depends on, and there's no bigger way to make a risk pool than, than this. So, it also makes economic sense. Um, if you just look at the numbers, it turns out that there have been more than two dozen studies looking at the savings and cost, uh, and every one of them, with two exceptions of two other studies that I'll talk about momentarily, every one of them shows that we can at least break even, if not save money, uh, by doing this. So there's a large volume of evidence, of, of, of analysis, done by literally dozens of economists independently, showing the same conclusion. So it's not just sort of a one-off thing. Here's one uh, such analysis, um, and it's, uh, this is from Professor Gerald Friedman, who was the head of the Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. There, I said it all, when he wrote this. <laughs> Try to say it right. Um, and he said um, that, guess what, there are new costs, but there are more new savings. So what are the new costs? He says, first of all, you'd have to pay more for Medicaid patients, because they would then be in the Medicare for all program, right? So today, I get about $30 when I see a Medicaid patient. I get about $100 for a Medicare patient and about $130 for a Cigna or a Blue Cross patient, which means I have to assess what you're worth to me financially before I let you into my practice, and that makes me sick. I hate doing that. Plus, it's expensive. I don't want to do it. So if every patient were worth the same because we were all in one system, you wouldn't have to do that, but there would be a cost. And by this analysis, it would be $74 billion. Uh, you'd also have to pay something for the uninsured, of course. Um, and everybody would start doing more things. You know, we'd all start going to dentists and doing, doing things more that, frankly, for the most part, we want people to be able to do. So there's new costs. Now, there's one analysis that stops here. Got a lot of press in the USA Today and Wall Street Journal um, a couple years ago, right before the election, and it said we can't afford the new costs but it didn't look at the new savings, and that's disingenuous. So what are the new savings? First, there's one program to administer, not dozens for the government, so there's a small savings there. Um, secondly, health insurance administration would, of course, plummet the cost of doing that, and we'll show you the impact of that on jobs. And then, of course, the administrative cost to doctors and hospitals would plummet saving you this money, which you could recoup by paying less for the service, reduce the fees by that much, and we, break, we stay whole, but the country can save, can save money. So you can reclaim, reclaim those costs. The average doctor spends $85,000 a year, according to a Milliman study two years ago, that, that is doing nothing but managing the insurance industry. The average hospital has, I don't know the number, but hundreds of staff managing the insurance industry. Toronto General has three people working in billing, 
right? And one of those three takes care of Americans who come over the border. You know, here we have literally buildings full of people. We have more full-time equivalents working in billing and accounts receivable for hospitals, according to national labor data. We have more full-time people working in billings and accounts receivable for hospitals than we have beds. So the average hospital in the USA can put a full-time billing person at the foot of every bed and have a department larger than Toronto General's left over. That's wasteful. That's wasteful. It's not helping anybody. And lastly, of course, let Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs and devices. So that's the other flaw uh, that you see in studies sometimes. I don't know what the right numbers are for this. This is one study. There are dozens, as I said. Each economist makes different assumptions, different models, different buckets. I'm not an economist. Um, so I don't know what the right numbers are. I just know that there's a number that belongs in the, in the bucket of letting Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs. And that number is not zero. So the other study that I'm so critical of had no savings from letting Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs and devices. And that's just, that's just wrong. We can talk more about that if you're interested. But, so one last piece on this, you know, I, I, we're talking about a system that's somewhat similar to Canada's. And whenever I bring up Canada, the first answer I get from people is, Canada, it's different, it's bigger, you know, it's not as uh, diverse, you know, it's got this, it's got that, it's not the same as us. Why would you think a system like Canada's could possibly work here? And so let's look at this. It turns out before 1971, the Canadian healthcare system was producing results almost identical to ours almost identical, before 1971. Our costs, America's and Canada's, were following the same trend, we were the same percentage of GDP, we were the same, and our life expectancies were just a few months apart. And then we had a fork in the road strategically. We, in, two, in 1973, created the managed care movement, and they, in 1971, finished implementing their Medicare for All program. Remember, they call it Medicare. So, a fork in the road, the same, we went creating the managed care industry, and they went with a Medicare for All program. So how does that look? Well, first, expenses. Here's percentage of GDP. There we are relentlessly climbing up to about 19% um, today. You've seen that chart. Here's the HMO Act passing ostensibly to reduce the cost of health care. Not really terribly impressive at being successful at that. Here's Canada's data. Here's Canada's data. We were the same and then we were different. And now they spend half of what we spend. So it's not because it's such a different country, it's because they had a different policy. And our life expectancies are, have changed too. So this data only goes back to 1979, I apologize for that, but in 1979, we were about a year apart with them living about a year longer than us at that point, and now they live nearly three years longer than we do. We were the same, we made a policy decision, and now they spend half and live and live three years longer. I rest my case. Um, so the last thing that I want to tell you is that there's uh, this movie that I, um, that I have out back there for you for free. <laughs> Sorry, it's free. Uh, I have DVDs of it, and, and you're, you're more than welcome to pick it up. It's created by this guy, Richard Master. He's, the, he's, a small, he's not a healthcare person, he's a small business person. He uh, runs a factory in the East Coast, uh, and he got fed up with the high cost of healthcare. Uh, this past year, his health insurance for his employees went up by $4 per, per hour per employee and he's just fed up with that. So, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? So he um, started working on this issue and he came to the same conclusion I did and produced this film that's um, not about the touchy-feely life extending part of Medicare for All. It's about the business side of this and I recommend you watch it. It's in the back um, and you have it for free and uh, it's CEO to CEO. But you all are, are clever and I'm, and I'm sure you, you can, you, you'll get a lot out of it. So, so there's that. And the last thing I would just say is uh, you don't have to be a physician to join our group. Um, anybody can join. You can follow us on Facebook. We, we tweet, you know, all this stuff. So I'll have, you know, join us online. And I've got um, sign-up sheets in the, in the back, too, over by the free DVDs. That's what I got to say. I didn't even take, the, didn't even take my time. <laughs> Okay, our next speaker is Dr. John C. Goodman. He's the President, CEO, and Kelly Wright Fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. He received his PhD in economics from Columbia University, and he's taught and done research at Columbia, Stanford University, Dartmouth College, Southern Methodist University, and the University of Dallas. He writes regularly for such newspapers as the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Investors Business Daily, and the Los Angeles Times. 
and he's the author of nine books, including Patient Power, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis, and Lives at Risk, Single Payer National Health Insurance Around the World. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Goodman. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Ponder. Uh, introduction like that makes me feel like I should run for office. I'm John Goodman. I approve that message. Uh, I have a cell phone with me, um, but not because I think I'm going to get an emergency call while I'm talking with you. Uh, I just want to make a point. There are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. Even the panhandler over here on the street corner probably has a cell phone, but he probably doesn't have very good access to health care. Uh, if something goes wrong with my cell phone in Dallas, Texas, there are a dozen places I can drop into without any appointment and get high-quality, low-cost repairs. There are places that will send someone to my condo and repair my iPhone uh, right in my own home. Uh, there's a national chain it's called Eye Doctors, the people who work for it. Eye Hospital, the people who work for it are called Eye Doctors. But if something happens to me, the average wait in the United States today to see a new doctor is three weeks. And in Boston, where we're told they had universal coverage even before there was Obamacare, the average wait to see a new doctor is three and a half months. Amazingly, one out of every 10 Americans who enters an emergency room leaves without ever seeing a doctor just because they get tired of waiting. In some California hospitals, it's one in five, which is about what it is in Canada. Now, both on the right and the left, uh, we spent a lot of time through the years arguing about the differences between the United States and Canada. And let me confess that I've been part of that. In fact, I wrote a whole book about it. And uh, this book, Lives at Risk, goes through all the criticisms of the American healthcare system and it compares it to other countries and it says, oh, those other countries have the same kinds of problems. In some cases, the problems are much worse. Now, there's only one thing I didn't say in this book that I wish I had said. And that is that for all the differences among these systems, we're really about 80% the same. You know, both the American system and the Canadian system are huge bureaucracies that resemble the Postal Service or the Department of Motor Vehicles a lot more than the market for the repair of, of a cell phone. Now, why is the market so kind to the cell phone and so mean to me and you? I think it's because that cell phone is produced in a real market with real prices where entrepreneurs know if they solve our problems, they can make millions of dollars. Whereas over in healthcare, we have so suppressed the market year after year, decade after decade, that none of us ever sees a real price for anything. No patient, no doctor, uh, no employer, no employee. What we have done is we've created a bureaucratic system, which both in the United States and in Canada has many similar problems. In Canada, when you see a doctor, it's free. In the United States, it's almost free. Every time you and I in this country see a doctor and spend a dollar, only 10 cents is coming out of our own pocket. The other 90 cents is paid for by an employer, an insurance company, or government. In both countries, the primary way we pay for care when we receive it is not with money, it's with time. Um, if you um, look at... Um, Look at the, um, sorry, um, what we forget so often when we suppress the market, when we suppress the price system, is that um, we elevate the importance of non-price barriers to care and non-market barriers to care. Now, what are those non-market barriers? How long does it take you on the phone to make an appointment with a doctor? How many weeks or months do you have to wait until you see the doctor? How long does it take you to go from your office or your home to the doctor's office and back again? And once there, how long do you have to wait until you see the doctor? Those are non-market barriers to care. And there's lots of evidence that we could talk about if you like, that those non-market barriers are a greater deterrent to receiving care than the money price that patients have to pay. And that's not just true for the middle class. It's also true for the poor on Medicaid. Now, in the United States, there are about 43 million people on food stamps. People on food stamps can go into any supermarket that you and I can go into. They can buy almost any product that we buy. They pay the same price that we pay. When they go to the checkout counter in the old days, they would put down cash and then their food stamps. These days, they have a credit card. 
And you never hear it said that low-income people don't have access to supermarkets. And the worst thing that can happen is they get on a bus and go a couple of miles. But you never hear it said that supermarkets are not taking any more food stamp uh, customers. Now, over in the Medicaid program, we now have about 74 million people. And they're the same people in many cases. And what's the biggest problem they have? Finding a doctor who will see them. I was in Boston not long ago, and I was talking to a female cab driver, and I said, how's the system working in Massachusetts? And she said, well, I had to go down a list of 21 doctors before I found one uh, that would see me. And I said, what kind of insurance do you have? She was in Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts program called Medicaid. And I said, well, were you going down the yellow pages of these 21 doctors? She said, no, no, I was going down the list that Mass Health gave me. That's what they call universal coverage in Massachusetts these days. Now, when low-income people can't find a doctor, what do they do? They go to community health centers, they go to the emergency rooms of hospitals, safety net hospitals, and my city, it would be Parkland Hospital, where unless you're bleeding all over the floor, you can wait four, five, six hours for care, depending on the time of day and the day of the week. Um, this is what, uh, what is happening uh, across the country. Now, at the same time, there are 2,000 walk-in clinics in the CVS pharmacies, which you have here, Minute Clinics, all of you have access to. The reason they call it Minute Clinic is because they're suggesting to you that they know that your time is valuable as well as your money. And studies show that the care delivered in these Minute Clinics by these nurses uh, follows best practices or well or better than traditional primary care. So it's high quality, low cost. The problem is this, in the city where I live, the charge for a sore throat or an earache would be about $75. But Medicaid only pays half that. So the medical clinics aren't seeing any of the Medicaid patients. They're down at Parkland Emergency Room waiting hours if they get care at all. We could enormously expand health care for low-income people throughout this country just overnight by letting them buy care the way they buy food. It would be just that simple. If we want to solve our problems, we need to let people buy health care the way they buy food. We need to free the patient. Then we need to free the doctor. Um, doctors are the only professionals in our society who are not free to repackage and reprice their services. When mar the market changes, when demand changes, when anything changes, they are slaves to a third-party payer system. And that's not just true here, it's also true in Canada. Have you ever wondered why doctors don't want to talk to you on the telephone? Every other professional I know talks to me by phone, talks to me by emails. Well, it's because Medicare has 7,400 procedures that it will pay doctors to do, and this is the absolute worst way to pay any professional. Because no matter how smart you are, if you try to make a list of things you'll pay for, and everything you leave off the list is something you won't pay for, you're never gonna have everything on the list that you want doctors to do. In this case, they forgot the phone, and they forgot email. And it's not just in this country, the same thing is true in Canada. So if we want to reform the system, we have to free the patient and we have to free the doctor. Then people ask me, uh, can the free market work in healthcare? And my quick response is the free market is the only thing that works in healthcare. Show me a healthcare market where there's no Blue Cross, no Medicare, no employer, and I'll show you a market that probably works. Now, looking around the room, I'm gonna guess that most of you don't know very much about the market for cosmetic surgery. But give it another 10 years, and even you people will be interested. This is a market where We've had huge increase in demand, all kinds of technological change of the kind that we're told, increases cost everywhere else in the system, and yet the real price of cosmetic surgery keeps going down, down, down. You get package prices, you have price competition. Same thing with LASIK surgery. The real price keeps going down, 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 despite all kinds of technological change. You have price competition, you have quality competition, package prices, rx.com, allows you to buy drugs online, why? Because they're competing with a local pharmacy. If Blue Cross paid all the bills, there would be no Rx.com. It's there because of cash paying patients. I've already mentioned the walk-in clinics. The market for medical tourism is a real market where the third-party payers aren't. 
63,000 Canadians came to the United States last year to get medical care, probably because they got tired of waiting in Canada. 63,000. Did you know that Canadian patients can come to the United States and get a hip or knee replacement for half, half of what you would pay for the same operation? They're paying even less than what Medicare pays. These are free market prices. And you can take advantage of that same technique and ask me in the question uh, session, I'll tell you how you do it. So we need to free the doctors, free the patients, and free the entrepreneurs to solve our problems the way they're solved in every other market. Now, um, let's talk for a few minutes about uh, Medicare and Obamacare. The Democrats gave us Obamacare. Most Democrats in Congress would like to have a Medicare system for all of, of, of the country. But they gave us Obamacare. Why? Because of all kinds of problems that we can talk about. But here's what, the message I want to leave with you. There's not a single problem in Obamacare today, which by the way leaves 30 million people without insurance. It's not a single Obamacare problem that goes away by trying to put all those people in Medicare, right? You still have the question of, well, what premium do they have to pay? Is this premium going to vary by age, by income, uh, by health status? Or what happens if they don't pay the premium, as 30 million people are not right now? And what is going to be the role of the employer? Right now, most people get insurance through the employer. Are they going to have to pay something? And if so, what is it going to be? Uh, these problems are not going to be away. And then there's the problem with the health insurance exchange. I'm one of the few people that's been writing about the fact that we have a race to the bottom in the health insurance exchanges. And by that, I mean that the kind of insurance that's being offered in most Obamacare exchanges today looks like Medicaid. You can't get to the best doctors and the best hospitals that Ed talked about uh, on these Obamacare programs. But now let's say we put all these people in Medicare. Uh, he didn't mention it, but a third of all the seniors in Medicare are in Medicare Advantage programs. These are private insurance programs run by uh, uh, Humana and uh, Aetna and Cigna and others. And, uh, and how do you get into one of these? You get it through an exchange. So all the problems with the exchanges in Obamacare are potentially the same problems that we would face in Medicare. Potentially, we could have the same race to the bottom. Now, right now, we're not having that race to the bottom because the Medicare Advantage program is done right, just as the Obamacare exchange is done wrong. And by right, I mean we have something much closer to a market for sick people. And um, the Brookings, the liberal Brookings Institution has concluded that within Medicare, the part of Medicare that works the best, uh, by that I mean has the highest quality and the lowest cost, are these Medicare Advantage programs. And within Medicare Advantage, the ones that work the best are ones that are run by doctors. And you should appreciate that, Ed. Um, so, um, so number one, we don't solve problems by just saying, okay, now we're gonna call the whole thing Medicare. All those problems don't go away. And, um, and by the way, the reason the Democrats didn't put everybody in Medicare is because of the cost. It costs about 15% of your income. That's, uh, that's basically the cost of Medicare for all. So how many people are going to vote to give up their current insurance in order to pay 15% of their income to the federal government for a system that they, you, you, you will say, yes, that's good. Um, but, but, but you were a minority. <laughs> Most people didn't raise their hands. Um, all right, so, um, so no problems. Uh, I, every one of those problems has to be solved. There is a way to solve these problems. There is a way to move from where we are now uh, to, to a market-based system. Uh, and that is what I want to talk to you more about tonight. But that would mean empowering individuals, giving them control over the money, stopping this idea that the third party payers are going to tell the doctors what to do. Thank you very much. Okay, now what we have scheduled is five minutes of response, rebuttal, however you want to put it uh, on each side, and we'll start, we'll start here. I got a cell phone too. And, and I'm really glad I got to pick my cell phone um, because we all want different things from a cell phone. Some of us want a good camera. Some want good this or good that. 
Um, so we get to pick our own cell phone, and it's important that we do, just like it's important that we get to pick our own doctors. I get to pick my own network. I, I pick my own network, and, and, I, and I change my network because all the networks are crummy. They all have dropped calls, depending on where you are. So I think it's a really pretty apt metaphor. We want control over our choice of the, way, the thing we interact with, the cell phone or the doctor, but the only reason we need choice over networks is because there aren't any good networks, frankly, in my experience. So you mentioned that, that uh, we're the same, as, same bureaucracy in all this as Canada, that there's no advantages in Canada, that I wonder why it is they spend half as much, and since starting this strategy, they live three years longer, according to internationally published um, data. Um, the, I'm not here at all to defend um, um, the ACA uh, or Medicare Advantage or any of these, of these options. I think the ACA in many ways was a step forward. I personally have insurance. I was personally able to get some health care that I needed because of the ACA, because of my pre-existing conditions. But despite that, I'm not here to defend it. I think there's huge problems with it, primarily that it preserves the egregious uh, insurance industry. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 to, but to make the claim that, that there's nothing that's wrong with the ACA that a Medicare for all problem, a Medicare for all solution wouldn't solve is, I mean, that's just really an incredibly empty statement. Um, look at the things that are wrong with, with, with the ACA, uh, the networks, the fact that's, that, the, that the insurance you buy through the ACA tells you which doctor to go to. That wouldn't happen under Medicare for all. Um, the fact that the, we haven't figured out exactly how we want to fund it in terms of how much employers should pay, how much individuals should pay, that's because there are literally dozens of good ways you could work that out. And if you want, I can, I can walk you through that or I can send you a white paper that was released um, by, by the same folks who released the Senate bill. I can, I can walk you through that. There are dozens of ways and we need to have that, we need to have that as a national um, strat strategic discussion. But the most important thing that I think would be different under Medicare for All that's not really the case under the ACA because of the insurance industry, is it would, for the first time in our country, establish a business case for long-term public health improvement. When you look at Canada and see they're living longer than we are now, and you look at every other modern nation and realize that a few years ago we used to be at least average in terms of life expectancy, and now we're typically the worst, most international measures of how our system is performing say that we have some of the worst healthcare outcomes in the, in the world, and, and that's just not the way it needs to be. And, and you look at it, the idea that if you capture everybody in the same system, in the same program, then something you did today to improve the population's health would benefit the system five and 10 years from now because they would be healthier. Under today's system, if an insurance company tries to do that, they know that they have something like 20% annual turnover. You change jobs, your employer changes, they know you have this turnover. And so a, an insurance company today is punished if they do something that'll take five years to improve your health, like a campaign for colonoscopies or, or really good treatment of hypertension or diabetes. It takes several years for that, and at that point, you won't be a member of that insurance company. But under a Medicare for All program, you would be, because it would be still yours five and 10 years from now when you don't have that stroke. So the investment in long-term benefits is, is huge. I, I'm certainly not here to defend Medicare Advantage as a solution. If you look at any Medicare Advantage plan in, in New York City, there's not a one that covers Sloan Kettering. So if you get the cancer in New York City and you've made the unfortunate choice to have a Medicare Advantage program instead of a supplement like my mother-in-law, if you have a Medicare Advantage program and you have cancer in New York City, you can't go to the premier hospital for cancer in New York City. If, if my mother-in-law had an Advantage program in Florida, she couldn't have afforded to come here uh, to St. Louis. Um, Medicare Advantage program, Medicare has a 2.2% overhead, Medicare Advantage is a 4.5% 4, 4 profit and a 9.1% overhead. So they deliver something like 86 cents on the dollar towards, towards healthcare. Um, so the answer is just a real simple solution. We don't need to have some elaborate scheme of, of you know, how you refund people's health savings accounts and we don't need some elaborate scheme that just creates more overhead, more complexity. A nice, simple solution. We built it 52 years ago, fix the couple of problems that I outlined to you and give that to everybody. It's real simple. I showed you tons of data and can show you tons more that it's really prudent and it builds on a system that Americans should be enormously proud of. Uh, let me start with that Sloan 
Kettering example because I want you all to understand what I think an ideal healthcare system would look like. Uh, have you ever noticed on TV you see uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America uh, saying, if you have cancer, come to us? Have you, any of you seen those? Uh, that's an example of, uh, of a center that thinks it's really good at something, and their market is really Medicare patients. They're trying to get Medicare patients to come where they provide a lot of different services that you wouldn't ordinarily get under Medicare. Um, that's the kind of model I think is the right one. Now, they're not in any Obamacare exchange because the rates are too low and because the incentives are so bad. So in my ideal healthcare system, you would have really good centers of excellence specializing in diseases, competing with each other. And so if you had cancer or heart disease or some other problem, you would get the kind of competition you see in a normal market. Now, let me go to a couple of other uh, points that, uh, that Ed made. Uh, do we really spend twice as much as all the other countries? Um, remember I told you nobody ever sees a real price for anything in our healthcare system? That's true in England and France and all over the developed world. Uh, we've suppressed the market everywhere. Well, the way we do national income accounting, the way we decide how much we're spending on health care, is we add up all the expenses just the way we do it for every other good or service. But if every health care price is a phony price, you add them all up, what you get is one big phony price. So the truth of the matter is no country knows what it's really spending on health care. But if there are any economics students here, you know one of the first things you learn in economics is the real cost to a country of providing something is not necessarily the price you pay, it's the opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost is the labor, the doctors, the, the, the nurses, the hospital beds uh, that you use to produce uh, the outcomes, because those people could have been doing something else. They could have been, been producing something else. And by that measure, we're, the United States is about in the middle of the pack. We're about in the middle of the OECD world. Uh, we're not the most expensive uh, system when you look at real resources. Now, as for administrative costs, uh, all these studies of administrative costs, you know what they do? They, Add up the cost of health insurance companies, advertising, collecting premiums, all that gets included in, in administrating. But when they go to Medicare, they don't add in the cost of collecting taxes. Well, look folks, that's not a fair comparison. When you do the comparison the right way and consider all the costs, Milliman, who Ed cited as an authority, has concluded that Medicare costs more than private insurance. Um, savings on drugs, uh, uh, he mentioned that there was one study that said there was no, no savings. Guess who did that study? It was the Congressional Budget Office. And why does the Congressional Budget Office say there's no savings? Because they say if you did it the way the Veterans Administration does it and say there's certain drugs, you know, if we don't get the right price, you can't have them. Uh, then there are savings, okay, if you do that. But we have under Medicare a rule that you have to cover every drug out there. And what the CBO says, if that's going to be the rule, you're not going to save any money by trying to negotiate. It's like Donald Trump says, if you, if, if, when you negotiate, if you want to win, you have to be able to walk away from the table. The VA can walk away from the table. Medicare uh, cannot. Um, life expectancy. Why is life expectancy for seniors so much better in this country than all across the developed world? I, I've not seen those statistics recently, but for a long time I have had a theory about it, and that is when seniors have to compete for healthcare resources for the younger population, uh, they lose out. And one of the reasons they lose out is that all over the developed world, politicians have discovered something very, very important about the politics of medicine, and that is most people aren't sick. And if you end up spending all your money on sick people, then you're not touching most voters. And so this is why when we did the Medicare Modernization Act uh, uh, and expanded prescription drugs, this is why Congress went and covered a lot of little stuff that every senior could have afforded on their own and had this big <laughs> donut hole uh, where they have extra costs and, 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 and have cat not have catastrophic coverage that, uh, that could bankrupt any senior. Uh, our politicians, just like the politicians abroad, have an incentive to spend more money on healthy people and less money on sick people than any of us would want if we were making that decision on our own. Uh, and then comparing life expectancy in the United States with Canada or any other country, um, I don't need to tell you all, we're the most heterogeneous of all developed countries. And we often get compared to uh, populations that are more homogeneous than we are. So. Uh, 
in, in, I guarantee you in Canada, the Indian, uh, Inuits don't have the same life expectancy as the rest of the population. Uh, the Cree Indians don't. Poor don't have the same life expectancy as the rich in Canada. Um, but if you compare like with like, uh, uh, if you compare Americans of, European of Northern European descent, like in Minnesota, with uh, Northern Europeans, uh, the statistics are about the same. Okay, uh, now we get to the Q&A, the, the uh, audience participation. We do have a couple of ground rules. One is uh, to stand and identify yourself, raise your hand, and I'll, I'll um, point to whoever I see first. Uh, pose a question as opposed to making a speech. Uh, and be sure to identify if your question is for Dr. Goodman, uh, Dr. Westbart, or both. Yes. Um, just one correction, I never said I wanted to go back to what we had. Um, we've had a hundred years of suppression of the market, mainly caused by doctors, by the way. Um, but, um, but what would I do is I would liberate uh, uh, the uh, employment law. I mean, what, what we have is the government telling employers that I have to operate under a certain system. I would let every employee and every employer choose between wages and health insurance and so so I, I what I think would be fair is you come to work you say you have a package of benefits and it's a certain number and you could have as much in health care as you want as much in wages as you want and right now um, we do not allow you or your employer to make those decisions we should and um, I think we need to recognize that older workers their health care does cost more and uh, uh, that's just a reality, and uh, and they may want more coverage for uh, for various reasons, but let let people let those decisions be made by the choice of the employee and the employer, and not by arbitrary tax law, which really makes no sense. Any comment on that? So um, I want to go back to sort of the first or second thing I said, which is that my primary passion is about patients, um, and so I'm imagining this system which is not hard to imagine because I've seen this way too often where somebody was struggling to make a decision between let's say wages and healthcare and they've got four kids or two kids and they've got um, a, kid, a kid in school or something and frankly the, the reality of making their budget work today versus the I'm not gonna get sick, I'm, I'm, I'm indestructible in the future means that they choose not to buy healthcare or they buy a really crummy policy that exposes them to all kinds of problems. So that's fine in your world where we then um, let them make that decision. My question is, <laughs> so I'm the doctor in the emergency room and somebody rolls in with a heart attack and they're about to die and they don't have insurance because they decided that wasn't a priority because they thought they were indestructible. What do I do? Do I walk away? Do I let them die? Do I put them off in the corner? Do I treat them not quite as well? Do I, do I only do my good care for the people that are paying me good? What, what do, you, what do you do with these catastrophes? And, it, and if, you, if the answer is, well, you know, that's where we'll have a safety net, we'll take care of them, then my response to that is, well, I would find that much more prudent. If I, if, for example, we've done that with dialysis, right? We've decided as a nation that almost everybody in the country, if, they, if their kidneys fail and they need dialysis, that's one of the other ways to get Medicare. So we as a country have decided the, what is it, $75,000 a year. If you need dialysis, you get Medicare. And that's good because they, they all die otherwise. All right, well, that's fine. I personally think it's far more, if you've made that decision, if you're not willing to say let them die, I think it's a lot more sensible to 
to treat their blood pressure, to buy them the insulin, to do the preventive stuff that maybe won't make them never get dialysis ready, but it might delay it by five years. And that difference by itself is a huge savings. So what do you do with these catastrophes? And if you're gonna not let them die, why not be prudent about it? Why waste the money? Um, may, I, uh, may, may I, just, just one quick. Um, we're actually closer on a lot of things than some of you may realize. Um, I wrote the Sessions Cassidy health care bill in the last session of Congress. And under that bill, we would have given every American who doesn't get insurance from an employer or from the government uh, a certain sum of money, a refundable tax credit. And, and if they did nothing else, it would buy primary care for everyone and, and then some. And it would get, so no one would be kept out of the system. No one would be, uh, uh, denied uh, uh, primary care or pre preventive care, um, and that would be free. It would be free for everybody. So even if you didn't owe any taxes, it's refundable. So, so yes, I believe that there should be that. That should be there, and then there should be a safety net. Now, there is not a government w in the world that isn't allowing people to die. Okay, they all do this, and Britain is especially bad at it. And as if you live in Britain and you need the latest cancer uh, medicine, uh, the government decides whether you're going to get it. And there are thousands of British cancer patients who have to choose between uh, not getting the medicine or paying thousands and thousands of dollars out of their own pocket. So, so that's, that uh, Britain is maybe one of the worst cases, but they're, all the countries are doing this. So I would say let's have everybody have access to primary care. Let's have um, a safety net. But let's recognize that um, that safety net may not always cover everything. Uh, I'm Sean Oscar, I'm one of the NDA students. Uh, you guys have both spoken extensively about the payment for health care. What about the utilization? What about the other side of it? Uh, you used the 1971 uh, Canada versus the United States stat. Prior to that, both Canada and the United States used hip replacements at a much lower rate than they do now. Aspirin, 25 cents, hip replacement, $5,000. In both of these systems, how does utilization change your uh, economic outcome? Did you say innovation? Yeah. Okay. No, you're saying utilization, weren't you? Yeah, sorry, utilization, and what it is, innovation by utilization, but what it was, how does utilization okay. affect your in, in the current system. <laughs> and in the system Ed's talking about. Uh, everybody's incentive is reverse, okay? The patient isn't paying for anything, so it's your incentive to grab all you can get, uh, unless you just get tired of being around doctors. And on the, on the provider side, the incentive is to charge everything you can to the third party, because that's how you get your income. And um, innovation, 90% of all innovation in healthcare is designed to get more money out of the government, or more money out of employers or Blue Cross. Uh, so unlike a normal market where innovation is focused on how do we lower costs and raise quality, innovation in healthcare is responding to very perverse incentives. Um, if you want the system to work, we've got to get rid of all those perverse incentives. So he, he's right that we actually have more, we have a lot that we agree about, but that doesn't make for a fun debate, so we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> So um, today, I mean, study after study today shows that an awful lot of the health care we do is not evidence-based and isn't actually improving health outcomes. There's very little variation around the country at who gets a hip fixed if they break their hip. You know, it doesn't matter. If you break your hip, you're going to get it fixed pretty much anywhere in the country. If you have arthritis in your hip, the likelihood that you're going to get your hip replaced is related to the number of orthopedic surgeons. So it's not based on the guidelines. It's, it's you know, roughly a third of most procedures you can think of, from hysterectomies to angioplasties to cardiac by bypass, roughly a third, it varies by specific, specific procedure, roughly a third of what we physicians do today is based on the perverse incentives. And, and so we find those cases. And we feel good about it, because you know, you, people like having some of these things done. But, but what happens, what's happened in, what happened in Canada when they put in their program, and frankly what happened here when, in 1965 when we put in Medicare was that the percentage of people whom physicians see who are actually very seriously ill goes up and the percentage of people who physicians see who really are not nearly that sick goes down. 
So we find a way to stay busy. And guess what? We're actually a lot happier in our work when we're seeing the people who are really in need of our care. So utilization, you don't actually need a very big change in utilization, which is good because we don't have an abundance of excess. We have about middle of the road number of doctors per person in the, in the country. So utilization in both systems when they transitioned actually overall was largely flat and, and shifted a little bit more towards the desperately sick who needed the care. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't say we're going to give everybody choice of physician. You can go to any physician you want to, which means you can go to a physician who does lots of hips, <laughs> or you can go to one who doesn't. Uh, or you'll hide, you're, you, you've changed nothing. So, um, so I do believe in managed care. I believe in medical home. I believe in integrated care and coordinated care. But I believe people should be able to choose among coordinated care systems. I believe those systems that work best are ones run by doctors, not out of HHS, not Medicare telling people. Not, Medicare shouldn't be telling doctors how to practice medicine. Let doctors decide how to practice medicine, but give them the good incentives and let, let, uh, let them form uh, a plans where they, uh, where they don't do the unnecessary things, where they, where they promise high quality necessary care and they don't waste your money and they don't waste your time. John Archer, I'm one of the MBA students as well. Um, I read somewhere that roughly 90% of emergency department work are due to us being such a litigious society. Hey, now that you have addressed that at all, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So, um, I, when, when I go and talk to our state legislators, the, the one that my, my, my state senator back when I started doing this, I walked up to her. She was actually the sponsor of a single payer bill in Missouri. And I walked up to her and said, Hey, I'm Dr. Ed Weisbart. I live in your district. And she took her hand over her forehead and she went, Doctor, I know, malpractice, malpractice, get away from me. She literally said that. And then I said, No, no, I, I like the bill that, you know, we had, we've become friends. So physicians in the United States are incredibly focused on malpractice because the the average internist in Missouri uh, pays between ten and $20,000 in 2018. I had reason to look this up recently. Between ten dollars and $19,000 per year for malpractice. Malpractice rates in Canada, since we've been talking about that, are more like three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 for most specialties. And the reason is, why does someone sue? Someone sues because something bad has happened, and so they don't know who's going to, they can no longer work or what have you, and they need someone to pay for the future cost of health care. Well, in the model we're discussing, there's, that's not a concern. The future cost of health care is something that's not going to make them have to go bankrupt. And the biggest single piece of the judgment against a doctor when we are sued, if, if they prevail, is to pay for the future cost of health care. So if you're, it's a less litigious society, I get that, that it's not an apples to orange comparison, but in general, the reason to sue goes away, or largely goes away, uh, except that I want to get back at them, and the judgment is a fraction. So it's a far less litigious society. Now, is the, I haven't seen that number that you're, that you're citing, but I've seen lots of analyses about the impact of malpractice on the economy in, in, in healthcare, and I can tell you the impact of malpractice on the mindset of physicians in this country is huge. I've been sued once, it's a, it's a dreadful experience and it goes on for years and years and it's, we hate it. And so are there things that we do from time to time to try to just avoid that? Yes, and those things are dangerous because they sometimes lead a cascade of problems. But the overall cost of it, number one, uh, from every analysis I've seen of it, the actual impact on the economics of healthcare is in the single digits of, of, of our expense. I've seen estimates, and I'm sorry, I don't have a source to quote you here, but I, but, I, but I can send you one if you need. I've seen numbers that are more in the order of 2% of what we spend on healthcare. And think about that, because most of the cost of healthcare happens when you actually are desperately sick, right? Most of the cost of healthcare happens when you've got cancer, or when you've got an end-stage heart disease, or you've got some bad disease, that's when the vast majority of what we spend on health care happens. And most of that's just, you, you really kind of like need that care. So I, I, maybe that's true for emergency departments. I don't know that number. It's interesting. I find that kind of hard to believe. But, but maybe it's true. But it's not, it's not representative of the entire picture. Well, on this subject, uh, I'm probably, well, I know I'm by far the most radical person on the stage. <laughs> because I want to get the lawyers out of this completely. Uh, I, want to, I want to see patients protected, and I want to see the right incentives for doctors. 
And let me just say that we're, we're underestimating the cost of the malpractice system. If you take all the adverse medical events, only about a fourth are, uh, are legitimately uh, uh, malpractice. Uh, about uh, half are negligent, uh, um, about half are accidents, and uh, maybe, maybe a fourth are accidents, and half are acts of God, and you can't sue for any of that. But what the doctors do is, in order to avoid their slice of the pie, they order more tests, and uh, each one of those tests uh, creates risks uh, uh, in the rest of the pie. So, so in an attempt to not be sued, doctors are causing more adverse uh, events in hospitals. Now, what I would like to see us do is um, have uh, something like uh, workers' comp. That was when you enter the hospital, you sign away your right to sue, but you know that if anything bad happens, you're going to be immediately paid. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether it's an act of God or whether it's an accident or what, that could have been prevented or whether it's malpractice. We're not going to argue about any of that. You just get paid. And if you don't think it's enough, you can pay a little bit more and have insurance and double and triple the, the, uh, the payout. So you get paid, and, and who's going to pay you? An insurance company that covers the hospital and the doctors. But now that insurance company and the hospital administrators are going to be the monitors of safety, and they're going to do something which you and the lawyers and juries and judges can never do. So let's, uh, let's let the people who are competent to reduce errors have good financial incentives to do that, and, and get out of the courtroom. I'm John Ford, I'm the US Congress. I made a joke about that earlier. There are, you are an economist, Dr. Goodman, and there are some issues I wonder in the foundational premises of your argument that I want to ask you about. The board, from my experience, and I'm a working class candidate, don't have extra money. They don't have disposable income to go out and buy health care as if they want a cell phone or anything else. There are questions also about agency, whether they're, and I'm not trying to insult anyone, but whether they are properly informed or to make these very complicated decisions about it. I think there's perhaps a foundational premise issue with the idea that pricing is perfect, whether markets operate perfectly, or whether the medical industry can self regulate. I know the financial industry can't, yet that's the foundational premise of the financial industry, is that we let it operate freely, it will operate fairly, which we know it doesn't. And oftentimes, the markets are catastrophically chaotic. So what would you say about these uh, articles of faith? Why should we trust that for so many decades that the markets will provide health care to everyone? Well, what I observe happening after so many decades is that people respond to perverse incentives by acting in perverse ways. <laughs> as long as you leave the perverse incentive there, I'm, I'm very, very confident that you'll continue to get perverse behavior. So if you take the perverse incentives away, that doesn't mean you get perfection. It doesn't mean you get fairness, but it means that anything bad that happens, now it's not happening because you, you, you made it financially attractive for it to happen. So I just want to get rid of perverse incentives and, and let the market work. And um, poor people, I think, are smarter than some of us give them credit for being. But whether they're smart or not, uh, I think everybody is an, uh, ought, I, I think if we are spending an enormous amount of money uh, at the federal level on health care, it is incredibly regressive the way we spend it. We, the, the people in the top 20 percent of the income distribution are getting six times the help from the federal government uh, at work uh, for the health insurance at work is people on the, on the bottom 20 percent. So this, it's terribly regressive. I want to take all that money and divide it up and give everybody a certain number of dollars. And I want to make sure that people who don't pay taxes get just as many dollars as everybody else. And uh, I believe that would be generous enough that it would certainly cover all primary care and, and a lot of uh, secondary care. And, um, and that ought to be our, uh, our guarantee uh, to the whole population. That's better than having some people with these rich, <laughs> some people have insurance that will pay for premature babies that will cost a million dollars, right? And these are families that never had the million dollars to begin with, so, so they didn't gain much of anything from that insurance. At the other hand, we have 30 million people with no insurance at all. That's a bad trait. Hello, my name is Fitz Jennings, and I'm the other congressman running the vote just haven't been tallied yet. 
But anyway, my question is for Dr. Goodman. Uh, in your book, Priceless, you uh, talk about getting rid of Medicaid and CHIP and instead giving people $2,000 vouchers for a private plan. Do you still support that, sir? Well, I don't remember wording exact that way. Uh, I've also, I've also, okay. Well, <laughs> I've also advocated since then letting Medicaid be a public option uh, in the exchange and letting anybody who wants to join Medicaid, let Bill, let Bill Gates join Medicaid, let it compete on a level playing field with, with, with private insurance. Um, but people who qualify for Medicaid need to get as much money as the average Medicaid patient now get, now is being spent on. Uh, so that's not $2,000, that's maybe twice that. But in any event, um, but other people um, um, should be able to, um, to join Medicaid. Now, now for Bill Gates, he would have to, if he wanted to join Medicaid, I would require him to pay the actuarially fair premium, whatever that happens to be. Uh, but I, would, I, I don't have a problem with Medicaid competing, but the main reason I want Medicaid to compete is not because I think Bill Gates is going to want to join it. I think people are trapped in Medicaid, and I think they can get better care outside of it. So, have you come up with a better implementation than what you did in 2014 in the book Crisis? Well, yes, I mean, we, uh, well, um, I, I can't remember if this was in the session Cassie bill, but I mean, I, th I think both Sessions and Cassie were open to the idea of, uh, of letting uh, Medicaid I think this is in the bill, that Medicaid patients can leave Medicaid, join a private plan, and, and get, uh, get tax relief, and that's something that is outlawed under Obamacare. Yeah. My, my problem is I don't trust private health care plans myself. Oh, well, I'm, okay. L let me just respond to that okay. very comment, because that's, that's, that's very good, because a lot of people don't understand that Medicaid is not run by the government. <laughs> And nor is Medicare in this country. Uh, we farm this out to private entities. And um, uh, in, in Medicaid, uh, all of Medicaid is administered by private entities, uh, Blue Cross and so forth. Um, At-risk entities are, are giving care to two-thirds of the Medicaid population. These are, these are health plans like Centene, uh, which is also in the exchanges. They're at risk, they can make profits, they can make losses. And uh, that's how we're running Medicaid. This isn't government, this is private sector competing for uh, patients. Now in Medicare, it's almost all administered privately and one third are in the same kind of health plans that the young people here today are in, managed by, by Humana and, and Cigna and so forth. So this idea of government versus private, we, we, get, we get wrapped up in a distinction that's not worth making. <laughs> Uh, the federal government doesn't know how to run these things. So it's going to contract with private contractors. The issue is, what kind of incentives do they have? If they have perverse incentives, you're going to get perverse outcomes. So one, one of the areas that we actually probably agree about is that we both mourn the loss of Uwe Reinhardt, who was a, recently passed away, and he was a healthcare thought leader, futurist. And he, he said, here's how you go about picking a health care plan, a health insurance plan. He said there's four steps to picking a health insurance plan. Step number one, decide what diseases you and your family are going to have in the coming year. <laughs> Step two, find the best doctors and hospitals to treat those diseases. Step three, find the insurance company that covers those doctors and hospitals. And step four, if there is no such plan, go back to step one and pick some new diseases. <laughs> so, um, I happened about four years ago uh, when Missouri was looking at, at, uh, tr at whether, what to do with Medicaid, whether to expand it and such. I had the, the honor, I guess, of being appointed as a member of the uh, Medicaid Expansion Task Force that uh, uh, Tim Jones, at the time the Speaker of the House, uh, put together. And we traveled around the state uh, hearing from people about Medicaid. Um, and, uh, and we learned some interesting things. In particular, this was when Medicaid was unlike what you just said, was entirely administered by the state of Missouri. They may have outsourced some of the claims managing, you know, mechanisms, but it was entirely managed by the state of Missouri. And the overhead for Medicaid for the state of Missouri, Mo Health Net at the time, which was internally run, including anything that they paid on a contractual basis outside, their published reports 
were that Mo Health Net's overhead at the time before managed care had much penetration here in Missouri to Medicaid was 2.2 percent, almost the same as, as the Medicare Trust Fund report, which, by the way, does include the cost of, of IRS staff, um, but almost the same, 2.2 percent. And we were looking at having private, uh, private uh, insurers start to take this over in a managed Medicaid strategy, and I asked every one of them what their overhead was, because we just heard it was 2.1%, I think was what the, num the number. We just heard that, and they all said, one said 7.5, one said 9, one said 12, I think, overhead. So that was interesting. It was hard for me to imagine how adding that much extra overhead could actually ratchet down the care when we already knew Medicaid was paying a unit cost that was pennies on the dollar, and that utilization in Medicaid for anything that was elective was, was really kind of poor because people couldn't get to a doctor. So we knew utilization and unit price were already low, so it was hard for me to imagine how, how, and how outsourcing this to a Medicaid, managed Medicaid company was going to save us anything. And indeed, I read in the newspaper just this, this past week, I guess it was, that Medicaid in Missouri, guess what, is going to be costing the state dramatically more than the state budgeted for uh, because of those problems. Um, so, you know, I'm not convinced that that's the, that that's the right solution. And Medicare, it's true that if you have a Part C plan, that's a privatized thing that's run by commercial in insurance. It's true that if you have a supplement, but that that's also run by commercial insurance, but traditional Medicare, Parts A and B, and indeed the model that we're looking at, no, I think some of the claims processing, and there are some, a few outsourced services, but, but no, that's, this is a public program, publicly funded and privately delivered. Okay, small, small correction. You, you, you can't put up on the screen something that says, look at all this, these costs that are being imposed on doctors uh, by the private insurers, all these administrative costs, and then turn around and say, but when we count the t cost of tax collection, we're going to ignore the costs that are being imposed on on taxpayers. So it, if you're going to, a fair comparison, you have to look at the social costs of, of both. Now, Ubi Reinhardt's idea, he thought was a silly idea, but I have a serious version of that idea. I don't think that uh, open season should be once a year. I think there should be continuous open season. <laughs> so you choose, a, you, you have a heart problem, you choose a plan with, uh, the, you know, the, with good, good heart doctors, now all of a sudden you got cancer, you want to move over to a different plan, I think you should be able to do that. Now, you can't, I wouldn't allow you to game the system, that is, I wouldn't allow you to buy a real skimpy plan and then you get sick and then buy a rich plan and, and not pay the cost of that upgrade. So, but as long as it's, uh, let's say, as long as you're moving from silver to silver, uh, I would have continuous open enrollment. But to do that, you have to have the kind of uh, risk adjustment that we don't have right now, with good risk adjustment, you'd have a market for sick people. You'd have advertisements on TV uh, saying, we're here to solve your problem. <coughs> I, let me just make a, a comparison. Have you ever noticed that on TV, all the casualty insurers are saying the same thing? You know, whether it's the uh, uh, Allstate saying, you know, you're in good hands, or whether it's the um, uh, who's the little bunny running around? I mean, every, every insurance ad you see has the same message. When the really bad thing happens, we're going to be there to take care of you. You don't ever see health insurers saying that. But if we had a good market, a real market for health insurance, they'd be saying the same thing too. If you get cancer, we're going to take care of you. If you get diabetes, we're going to take care of you. That's when you know, when you see ads like that, that's when you know the market is working. So we have ads like that, right? They're a little bit more covert, but I don't know if you've ever seen these, but there are actually uh, free echocardiogram devices traveling around the state that are offering free screening for congestive heart failure. Hooray. Why is that going on? It's going on because if you have, if you have a Medicare Advantage program, or even traditional Medicare, if you have traditional Medicare and you, and you, go, to the, and you, and you go to a system, uh, Medicare will pay more for a, for a CHF patient, a congestive heart failure patient, than for somebody without that. So, so the system, so, so the insurance companies, Medicare Advantage in particular, wants to find um, people that have congestive heart failure but who aren't really sick. So you run those ads on the TV machine, and guess what? The real sick people are already usually in a healthcare system someplace. The people you'll attract 
are the healthy ones who might be able to get the diagnosis. You meet the echocardiographic criteria for congestive heart failure, you can get the knock up in the, in the reimbursement, but it doesn't really make, um, make a difference. But all the nature you're of insurance yep. is that we're all in this together. No, no, but all you're saying is that people will exploit a, re a faulty reimbursement system, and it's just the same in Canada or in Medicare as it is anywhere else. So under a model where you can move around from insurance to insurance, the question is, who pays for the burn unit the week before you need it? Because stuff happens that's really expensive. And if I don't have to buy insurance that covers a burn unit until I get that horrible burn that I'm probably never going to get, so none of us are going to buy burn insurance unless we're in an industry that's we, likely, we, we start, who pays for that? We start with the premise that the burn insurance has to get paid. And what's happening under Obamacare is we're expecting these plans to take people who are sick and cost a lot and not get paid anything. And that's why all the insurers have left, the big insurers have left Obamacare and the only thing left is, is, is Medicaid. There's almost no conversation in public policy today about how to get risk adjustment right. But if you want the system to work, we ought to be talking about this very issue a lot. So come back in 20 years when we figured it out, because today we don't have anything like that doesn't, what you're describing doesn't exist today. Yes, but I'm a visionary. <laughs> or a hallucinator. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, John. That's sorry. That was, that was low, I didn't mean to insult you. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> So if I could elaborate on your point a little bit, the question is, what would people have to pay? And, and the particular study you're, you're citing is, is Professor Gerald Friedman's. And um, he has an analysis that's based on assumptions, which I think are probably reasonable. There are many other economists that have made assumptions pretty similar. And I'll give you the specific answer to what you're, to what you're asking to what Dr. Friedman has, has proposed. But understand that these are based on assumptions. And, and their modeling, and so every one of these is, is a little bit different. Under the tax structure that uh, Professor Friedman was, was, was promoting, um, he was saying that anybody who makes up to about $400,000 a year, uh, would, which is, what, 98% of us? I don't know. And we get up to that level of income would, of course, see um, a tax increase. Um, but people who make, uh, but they would see that tax increase as dramatically smaller than what they would save by eliminating premiums, you know, my, my $2,000 a month, you know, the, the, the average premium I think is uh, $12,000 for a family of four in 2016 uh, employer share. So the, the premiums would, would disappear, the co-pays would, would disappear, or we could maybe say a little bit, um, co-insurance would disappear, no risk of leaking. You know, if you decide to go to Mayo instead of to BJC or what have you, there would be no economic risk to that. So under the study that, that, uh, that you're referencing, um, he says up to uh, the tax structure, he said, which I think is about a 6% payroll tax. I don't really remember exactly. You know, I shouldn't even quote a number. But he, his, his assumption uh, was, that, was that it would be up to $400,000 a year of income and we would, everybody in that income level would break even or stay or, or do better. Now the Senate bill is very similar and the Senate bill has a, a white paper that came out at the same time that's got literally dozens of, of proposed uh, funding mechanisms and under every one of those, the, almost every American would be spending less because of getting rid of the bureaucracy and all these other things. You have to pay 15% of income and you either pay it through taxes or you pay some of it through taxes and the rest of it through premiums. It's hard for me to believe there wouldn't be any premium. Even in Medicare, we have premiums. But, um, but, but this is a lot of money, and you're asking people to give up their private insurance, which they know and often like, uh, for a system which may not go well. And having seen how poorly Obamacare has gone, uh, I don't see how you'll ever get public support for this. So 15% of income, well, if you look at it, we're currently spending 19% of our income on health care. Canada's currently spending half of that. Most other countries are spending half of that. Um, so 
you know, I'm not sure where that number is coming from, but you can, what, what I've seen some people do, and I don't know if you're, you've done this, some people have, have actually taken the average cost of a Medicare patient and said that's what the average cost of a 30-year-old would be too. And guess what? When you're 70, you're more expensive because you're sicker and you've got other stuff happening. So you can't just take the average cost of Medicare and roll that out and say that's the cost of, 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 of giving Medicare to uh, everybody. I, I didn't do that. Correct. That, that's exactly what Dr. Friedman said. He said 95% of Americans would pay less under this model. Well, uh, let me just tell you, okay, let me, okay. Well, just real quickly, uh, what happens in Canada is the main way uh, they try to save money is by limiting the resources that are devoted to health care. So Canada has one of the lowest rates of MRI scanners and CAT scanners among the developed world. It has a very low rate of acute care beds, and that's why the waiting is so long. Uh, we're talking about 10 months to get a, a knee replacement, which is why so many Folks are coming down here and paying out of pocket uh, for a knee replacement. But most important, I think that um, the reason I think people get misled is going all the way back to Anthony Beaven in Britain. They kept saying, we want health care to be the same for everybody, and that's what I thought you were implying. We're all in this together, that your access to care, your income shouldn't matter, your age shouldn't matter, your social class shouldn't matter. They said that over and over again. It has never happened. <laughs> there is uh, just as uh, a numerous, numerous studies in Britain have concluded there's just as much inequality in access to care today as there was way back 60 years ago. And I can tell you in Canada, if you look, you'll see that the Inuits and Crees, they don't have the same life expectancy as other Canadians. Low-income Canadians don't have the same life expectancy as high-income uh, uh, Canadians. And I have, um, I'll just tell you that whatever you have non-price, here's a principle, this is Goodman's principle of how healthcare politics works. Uh, whenever you have non-price rationing, wherever you have demand exceeds supply, high-income, well-educated people will find their way to the head of the line. The same uh, skills which allow people to do well in the private marketplace also allow them to do well in bureaucracies that ration by waiting. So I, I, um, to answer more of what you brought up, um, what, what do we learn from around the world? Um, the, probably the most important strategy for reducing costs on the hospital side is to establish global budgets. So for hospitals, so that they don't have to um, 
justify to the insurance company every, every Band-Aid that they've used. They need to do cost accounting internally so they can order intelligently, but the, the, the huge savings by having one global budget from one payer, instead of having to negotiate and having to track every, every single thing, global budgets is a, is a critical strategy for, for reducing healthcare costs. The other things we've learned is eliminating bureaucracy. I kind of described that during my talk. Another important thing we've learned is, for crying out loud, let the government negotiate the prices of the things that, that, we're, that, we're, that we're buying. Um, so median wait times in Canada, actually published data, I think from the OECD it is, uh, says that the uh, that 80 uh, emergent things are taken care of immediately in Canada, like they are in most other countries. But uh, elective surgery, the 80% of Canadians wait less than four months for elective surgery. Some wait much longer, but 80% wait less than four months for elective surgery. And in British Columbia, they're, they're pioneering this thing because they have one payer in the, in the province. You can actually go online in British Columbia and get a picture of a human body, point to the part of the body that's bothering you. It'll then tell you five different types of specialists that could take care of that. You pick the one, and then it shows you the waiting time within whatever geography you want around your house the waiting time for the next appointment for the orthopedist within five miles of your house. And if it turns out that that's longer than you want, you can, you can then say, send me 10 miles, send me 20 miles. So you can make rational decisions based on the waiting time for every doctor in, your, in the country. You can't do that in the United States because we don't have any way of beginning to collect that kind of data. The last piece I'd like to make about disparities in healthcare is how incredible Medicare is at solving that. We know that African Americans live shorter lifetimes than, than white Americans, but it turns out that when you go on to dialysis and you get Medicare, it turns out that African Americans live longer on dialysis than white Americans do. It turns out that if you're in the VA, African Americans' remaining life is longer age adjusted is longer than is white Americans. It turns out that the best strategy for dealing with disparities in healthcare is to just give everybody access to healthcare for crying out loud. I got one more short comment and that is to look just at Canada ignores what's going on in Europe. They, they provide good care. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I'll tell you uh, here in Springfield what, what we do the surgery is more related to the convenience of the family when they're coming back from Florida in the spring, than it is uh, when they can get in and when we can do it. Okay, one more final question, yeah, Ted. Just more to the, uh, okay. My frustration, whenever I give this debate about uh, single payer system, and everybody talks about Canada, is I, uh, I'm somebody who lived in Canada for two years. I can tell you that all of the, the horror stories that were told consistently about the Canadian system, that's just nonsense. That's just false. As somebody who lived there, I've been pushing doctors who can't, I, I may be waiting two or three days before I have to get in and so forth. So I can tell you this, the Canadian system works, whatever its flaws are, it works. And Americans are being told a lot about, what, about the problems of the Canadian system. I know because I've been there. I've done it. I think we should stop there. No, no. I haven't told you any horror stories about Canada tonight. What I've told you is that bureaucracy is 80% just like us. You know, it's just doctors are paid fee for service. They don't talk to you by telephone. They don't email you. It's like, it's like the post office. And both systems could be much, much better than they are now. No, 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 they uh, Go ahead. Dr. Weisberg, had it just right. They don't, there's not a lot of paperwork to do. There's none of this overhead. It's making an appointment. Like I said, the most I waited was three or four days, I think, for a very mild condition uh, on, on a couple of occasions. Got in, out, very kind. Um, and and I, I'm just saying that I think he described that system as correctly. Now, that may not be a reason to go to the Canadian system. I, I just like to let people know it's not a nightmare system, it's a really great system. By the way, uh, in Canada, it's easier to see a doctor than the United States. I want to I get that out. It's easier to get primary care in Canada, but, but if you want uh, um, uh, tests, if you want uh, uh, blood tests and other kinds of tests, that's harder to get in Canada. So anything that costs money is harder. Anything that's, that, that doesn't cost money is easier. <laughs>
So it turns out we profoundly overutilize tests, so that's not necessarily such a terrible thing. But why is it that primary care is more available in Canada? Because about 20, 25 years ago, they were having the same problem we were starting to ha we were having of too many specialists and not enough primary care doctors. And they recognized that as a nation and instructed the medical schools, if you want to keep getting well-funded by the federal government, you have to shift the balance. Here's a schedule. Here's how many more primary care doctors we want you to recruit. You can't just make somebody be it. You have to recruit the kinds of people that want to do it and train them with a positive experience to it. But you can make a national strategy that changes that. Here, we have two specialists for every primary care doctor. In most of the world, we have two primary care docs for doctors for every specialist. We can fix this. Yeah, but what that means is the healthy guy, just like you said, doesn't have much trouble getting to see a physician. He's in and out. But the elderly person that needs a new knee waits 10 months in pain. It's just not what the statistics show. The that statistics do not validate show. that. It is what they show. No. It is. You have to wait in pain for 10 months. They're not dying, so therefore it doesn't matter. We're, so moved, every, we're moving the same direction. We're, we're getting more and more like Canada every day. So every Canadian complains about the waiting list. I don't want to make light of it. It's a real fact. Every Canadian has a story about waiting for their whatever longer than they wanted to, and that's, they, they hate that. That's, they hate that. And in the next breath, though, they say, but you know how you guys put up with having to have a bake sale when you get leukemia, which a friend of mine had to do. Um, I literally, um, I... You know, they, they call our system, they see the injustice on our system. They could fix that problem by spending more, but they've made a decision that, you know, there are these egregious anecdotes, but we have them too on our side, and they've made the decision that this is the, how much they want to spend, and we can make these decisions as well. Well, we're past time. Uh, clearly, there is uh, plenty more to say. Our uh, presenters will be in the back and uh, um, for book signing, to talk with you a little bit more. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. I want to give our presenters one more round of applause. <laughs>